Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Now we're going to be talking about prophethood. So we have reached the stage where we are talking about our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, for me, after we've done God's existence, God's oneness, revelation, why Allah deserves to be worshipped, you don't really need to talk about prophethood per se. Because if someone understands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a reality, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists, that He is one, He's uniquely one, that He deserves to be worshipped, which means to love Allah, to know Allah, to obey Allah, and to single out and direct all of our internal and external acts of worship to Allah alone, then it's done. They should really internalize the fact that their life now is to align themselves and reconnect themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, you can add the prophethood section as additional evidence, but it also is like a standalone argument. It stands on its own two feet from that point of view. And many times when I interact with Christians or many different types of human beings, depending on who they are, I go straight to prophethood. I go straight to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, 1400 years ago, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with a profound message. And that message was, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah. There is no deity worthy of worship but Allah, but the deity. And Muhammad is the final messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this was the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we can rationally investigate this message and claim because he made a particular claim that not only is Allah worthy of worship not only is there no deity worthy of worship but Allah but that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his final messenger so we could rationally investigate this claim and what we could do we could go to the historical narratives and the testimonies concerning the life of our, of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and once we do this, we'll be in a position to make a conclusion about the truthfulness of that claim. Is it the prophetic truth? Is this statement the prophetic truth? Based upon the testimonies surrounding the life of the Prophet wasallam and the historical narratives, I believe we have a very strong argument to say that indeed Muhammad's claim wasallam, was a truthful one. Now this argument is not just a rational argument, we haven't just made it up. This argument can be found in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the Qur'an itself. Because look what Allah says, for example in chapter 81, Allah says your companion is not mad. The Arabic word here is quite interesting for companion. Do you know the Arabic word here that's used in the Qur'an? Sahibukum. Allah is saying your companion is not mad. Now the eloquence here is quite phenomenal. The eloquence is quite ph phenomenal. Why? Because with one word, it undermines their argument. Because Allah is not saying, your prophet is not mad. Allah is not saying, Muhammad is not mad. Allah is not saying, your, f your, your relative is not mad. Allah is not saying, th this man or your husband or your brother or your uncle is not mad. He's saying, your companion, which has an element of intimacy. It's not just a friend, but he's your companion. Someone who knows you intimately. And Allah is trying to say to them, you've known this man for 40 years. He's been your companion, you've eaten with him, you know about him, you call him the trustworthy. So how can you say he's mad? Because only companions see the first signs of madness. Like if you study psychology or psychotherapy or psychiatry, they usually interview friends and family. People who are intimate with that person from a social point of view to find out how did he react to find out what did he do in this situation to find out any signs that may lead to the conclusion that he is unwell or mad do you see the point here so Allah is saying your your argument is baseless you're saying he's mad but you're his friend intimate companion you would have known this don't just use this as some kind of strategy to get out of trying to understand this message because of your ego don't clutch at intellectual straws, right? Also Allah says in chapter 53, your companion has not, astray, ast not, has not strayed, he is not deluded, 
he does not speak from his own desire. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Muhammad is the messenger of God. So from this point of view, we can summarize the argument in a logical form. We can summarize the argument in the following way. Number one, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was either a liar, deluded, or speaking the truth. Number two, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could not have been a liar or deluded. Number three, the conclusion, therefore the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was speaking the truth. So let's address these possible explanations, okay? So, is the first possible explanation that he was a liar? Well, this is not only counterintuitive, but it's incongruent to all of the history that we understand. It really resists what we understand about the historical narratives and testimonies concerning the life of the Prophet even from a psychological profile point of view. Because think about this, he couldn't have been a liar because he was known as a trustworthy. Even his enemies would trust him with their wealth, with their goods, with their possessions. So to claim that he's a liar really is not making sense from a psychological and even social perspective here. What's very interesting also is that he was persecuted for his beliefs, boycotted and exiled from his beloved city. He was stoned in Taif for hours where the blood was running down his legs, the blood made his feet stick to his sandals. He was boycotted and abused. His companions were <coughs> tortured and murdered and killed, right? He was so hungry because of the boycott that he tied two stones to his stomach. And he was so brave, even in battle, because we know that there were battles at the time of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. He had to protect people under his wing. And these included Muslims and non-Muslims. He had to be a statesman to take care of people. And in his battles, he was just and he was merciful. And yet he was very brave as well. In the famous battle of Hunayn, what did he do? When the arrows were coming towards the army, the, the army, his companions had to inevitably retreat. But he was still marching forward saying, I am not a liar, I am the messenger of Allah. Such bravery. So when we consider the psychological profile, how could we claim he's a liar? Because people who lie, they lie for some kind of gain, some kind of wealth, some kind of status. Now you can't claim he basically was lying for status because he was so humble. So many traditions state that for months he'll be on water and dates, aswadain, just water and dates. There'll be no smoke coming out of the house of his wife Aisha. May Allah be pleased with her. Correct? What's also very significant is that when the Prophet ﷺ was invited to a house to eat rancid fat, he would accept the invitation and eat the rancid fat. He would say, oh what a wonderful curry vinegar is. He used to dip his bread in, in vinegar. So much humidity. When Arabs from outside of his area came to visit him, they would ask the question, Aina Muhammad? Where is Muhammad? Because they didn't recognize him, because he wasn't kingly. When an Arab came up to him and was, was, you know, he was shaken by his authority, the Prophet ﷺ said, basically, don't worry, I am, the, I am the son of a Bedouin woman who used to eat dried meat. Like, I'm just like you. And he used to make a dua and supplication for humility. Oh Allah, make me humble, make me die amongst the humble. Right? Dua to this effect. He made that type of supplication. And there are so many narratives about concerning his humility. So it wasn't about status and look who I am. He, of course. And what's very interesting, they offered him money, riches, women, power, land, glory, he rejected all of it just for the simple message of La ilaha illallah. There is no deity worthy of worship but the deity, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he was offered all of these things and he rejected them.
And this is highly significant from a psychological profile point of view. How can we claim he's a liar? Wallahi by Allah, to claim he is a liar is like claiming no one has spoken the truth. <laughs> this is very, very significant here. Because our, well not our, but an accusation or their accusation that he was a liar doesn't, doesn't hold water, doesn't hold its ground, cannot be justified just based on these very simple arguments. Just based on these very, very simple arguments. And there's much more we could talk about specifically that he wasn't a liar. But I think this is enough for now. And it's quite interesting that even academics and orientalists testified to this. Anyone who studies his life and, and anyone who is sincere would testify that he can't be a liar. For example, Montgomery Watt, he's the late emeritus professor in Arabic and Islamic studies in his book, Muhammad at Mecca, he says, his readiness concerning the Prophet wasallam, his readiness to undergo persecution for his beliefs, the high moral character of the men who believed in him and looked up to him as a leader and the greatness of his ultimate achievement all argue his fundamental integrity. To suppose Muhammad an imposter raises far more problems than it solves. That's quite interesting. You're asking, did he become Muslim? There is an opinion, I believe, about Montgomery Watt that he believed that the Prophet Muhammad was a prophet, but he had a theological issue that he was sent just for the Arabs. So the next question is, fine, he wasn't lying, but maybe he was deluded. Now to argue that someone is deluded is to argue the following, that he was misled into believing he was the messenger of God. And if someone is deluded, they have a strong conviction in the belief, but they have no evidence for it, okay? And another way of looking at the issue of delusion is that when someone is deluded, they speak falsehood while believing, whilst believing that it's true. Now there are many arguments, there is an accumulative case, we could build a case to show that the Prophet ﷺ was not deluded. Firstly, there are incidents to support that he couldn't be deluded. Because generally speaking, someone who believes in a certain claim but has no evidence for it, usually looks for evidence, right? That's what a deluded person does as well. And they like, they like to reaffirm their belief, even though there's hardly any evidence to support their belief. Now the Prophet ﷺ, he had sons, and his sons died at early age. One particular son was Ibrahim. And when his son Ibrahim passed away, there was a, an eclipse. And the Arabs at the time thought, you must be the Prophet now, look how special you are, because God made the eclipse happen because your son Ibrahim passed away. Now one who's deluded in some way would say, yes, you're right, I am the messenger of God. And there are many examples in his life that he could have used to support a so-called delusion. But he didn't. Look what he said. He said, the sun and moon do not come together for anyone's death amongst the people. These are the signs of God. So from this point of view, when you look at the life of the Prophet wasallam, you see that there are many incidences that he could have used to support a so-called delusion, but he didn't. Another argument to show that the Prophet ﷺ was not deluded is actually his prophecies. There are so many prophecies that have come true. The Prophet ﷺ has prophesied things that happened, he prophesied things that would happen after his death and hundreds of years after his death. So how could he be deluded when these prophecies came true? And even from a statistical point of view, you can't even start to claim that it's some kind of coincidence, especially when you add them up together. Here are some examples. The Mongol invasion. Now, we know the Mongol invasion was an eco-catastrophe for the Muslims. In around 1258, you had the ransacking of Baghdad. Baghdad at that time had thousands of books, hundreds of thousands of books. It was the center of the world's universities, education, coexistence, debate, intellectual culture and the Mongols came and they ransacked everything. 
they massacred people and they demolished the city up to one million people were killed it was a massacre and the Prophet ﷺ foretold the Mongol invasion in a tradition narrated by Muslim it's an authentic tradition he said the hour will not be established till you fight from a people amongst the non-Arabs they will be of red faces flat noses and small eyes their faces will look like flat shields and their shoes will be made of hair what's very interesting the Mongol army they had a unique furry boot hairy boot and it was called Degti Degti now I always say to people if this is not the Mongol army then uh, I'm Nigerian right <laughs> or I'm Chinese or I'm something totally different than you would think right because it, this is such a apt and concise description of the Mongols also we have another very famous prophetic tradition where the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace he said and this is narrated by Bukhari it's an authentic tradition that you see barefoot <coughs> unclothed Bedouin Arabs competing in the construction of tall buildings now this was a response to questioning the sign of, of the end days, the, the day of judgment and the Prophet ﷺ said one of the signs is that you see barefoot unclothed Bedouins competing in the construction of tall buildings now this is very interesting because if you were a rationalist at that time you would think the one who's competing in tall buildings would be the superpowers of the time which were the Romans and the Persians the Arabs in many cases used to build buildings in the ground because it was so hot yeah. some of the houses were in the ground and they just had tents now the Prophet upon him repeats saying, look, you know, the Bedouin Arabs will compete in tall buildings. And look what we have today. In the UAE, United Arab Emirates in Dubai, you have the tallest building in the world, which is over 800 feet high. It's called the Burj Khalifa. And relatively recently, the Saudis, another Bedouin group, well, they were originally were Bedouins, they said they're going to build the tallest building in the world in 2019. And it's going to be one kilometer high. And they're both from Bedouins. And they were unclothed. And there were Bedouin Arabs and now they're competing in tall buildings. Now one would argue, yeah, the Muslims have just done this just to prove this tradition. Yeah, you know? They, the, the Muslims done this just just to <coughs> just to basically, you know, prove this tradition. Well there are two counter arguments. Number one, why would someone be a deliberate sign for the end of times? Number two, did they also construct the social political landscape in order to have enough oil, to have lots of money to be able to basically build these tall buildings? Did they also make up the fact that they'll be rich? They just became rich only 50 or, uh, 50 or 60 years ago. So how can you say they just made this up? Because in order for the tall buildings to be built, they, the social economic circumstances had to be placed already, in place already. Yes, brother. The Marathis are spoken, they don't even know about the Hadith. Also, which is very interesting, many of the Bedouins, they don't even know about this prophetic tradition as well. And that's why we're saying here, if this were mere guesswork on his part, the discovery of oil would represent a massive stroke of luck. Because you have to also understand that before you could have this, these amazing buildings that you're competing with, competing against each other, that you have to say that basically there were the right social economic circumstances in place before that can happen. And as we said before, if the Prophet Muhammad were merely guessing, it, it, it wouldn't have made more sense to relate this prophecy to the superpowers of his time, namely the Persians and the Romans. Also what's very interesting, there's another prophetic tradition where the Prophet Muhammad said that one of the signs of the last hour, if you like, as the last hour, is that you will see tunnels built in Mecca and you see its buildings taller than its mountains, so therefore know that the matter is close at hand. I went to Hajj like around three years ago and I walked through these tunnies, tunnels. There are piercings in the mountains of Mecca and also the buildings are taller than mountains. the mountains themselves. The hadith, the reference, I'll give you the reference later. We don't have it here, but it's, it's, it's in one of the traditions. 
Sorry? That's a very clever point. Did you hear what the brother said? He said, well, what's very interesting as well, if someone was to disprove the hadith of the tall buildings that the Arabs are competing with one another, well, what can happen is that someone from the, from the non-Arabs should be competing with them as well. Right, which will, make, which will break down the prophetic tradition. That's another interesting insight. And there are many, many other traditions, to be honest. Right? There's even in a tradition in at tabarani and I think it's in the book Kitab al-Fitan. And this is a weak tradition, by the way. So in terms of authenticity, it's not that strong. I like to mention it because even a weak tradition is very powerful. Now, the tradition in at tabarani in Kitab al-Fitan basically says, and I'm paraphrasing, that there will be dishes and they will be communicating constantly and then people will break the ties of kingship I repeat there will be dishes communicating constantly and people will break the ties of kingship and the word for dishes is literally a dish and the word that's used now is the word for satellites and they're dishes and they communicate TV and there's a peer-reviewed journal it's actually in my book, I'll give you the reference that it's a peer-reviewed journal, academic journal that says there is a correlation between people sitting at home watching satellite TV and not having communal family ties anymore. You just don't make this stuff up. And this is a weak tradition from a historical point of view. And there are many more. These are just examples. There are many more that build the case. There are many more that build the case. So it is no wonder that the historian Dr. William Draper said the following. He said, Four years after the death of Justinian, AD 569, was born in Mecca in Arabia, the man who of all men has exercised the greatest influence on the, upon the human race, to be the religious head of many empires, to guide the daily life of one third of the human race, may perhaps justify the title, a messenger of God. Now, the first point is, there are some objections. There are objections to this argument because we know he couldn't be lying, he couldn't be deluded, so therefore he was speaking the truth. But let's be a little bit more academic here. One of the objections include, well this is just legendary. Yes, Mr. Zodis, you have all of these historical narratives and testimonies, but they're based on legend. They don't have a historical foundation. Okay? Now this is a gross ignorance a gross ignorance on the way that Islamic scholars preserved history. And I don't want to get into the academia behind this because we'll have to spend a whole day together. But I'll give you some references. I just want to illustrate something to you. I want to draw, to, draw, draw now two pictures, okay? I want to give you two scenarios. Just be rational. Put your rational thinking hats on. Imagine we're all historians. And what we do, we travel to this amazing place with these mountains and there is a desert. This place is called Egypt. And we know from other history that there was a certain king living in the area and there was a certain political, political climate. And what we do, we happen to find a letter. And it's signed by the king. And this letter doesn't really go against the political social circumstances of the time. We can carbon date the letter and it's around the period. So we can somewhat consider this as some valid history, correct? Correct? Yes. Sir. Good. So you accept this as history. Brilliant. Now let me give you a slightly different scenario. Very similar, but it's an enhanced scenario. We travel to a land with mountains and a desert. It's in Egypt. We know there was a king at that time with certain polit social political circumstances. We find a letter. It's signed by the king. The letter doesn't go against the social political circumstances of the time. But with this letter, what do we have in addition? We have some additional factors. We have an analysis of the text. 
a linguistic analysis and a historical analysis of the text. We also have a chain of narration concerning the source of the letter that A told B, B told C, C told D that it did come from the king and we have other biographies of all of these people to suggest that they were trustworthy in speaking the truth. Do you accept this as history? Which is stronger, the first scenario or the second scenario? Second scenario. Second scenario. Well done. The first scenario describes Western history, the second scenario describes Islamic history. We are very robust in the way we preserve our tradition. Now there are other contentions in academia behind this, but we could leave that aside for now. But generally speaking, that's the scenario. So it's a gross misunderstanding of Islamic history and the way we preserve is Islamic history. Another argument is, well this whole thing is unsound logic. It doesn't make sense logically. It doesn't follow logically. Because there is another option. That's what they're saying. Fine, you're saying he couldn't be lying, he couldn't be deluded, therefore he's speaking the truth. That's unsound logic. It's a non sequitur. It doesn't logically follow because there's another option. And they say, well, the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace was not lying from the perspective of being immoral. So it was a moral lie. So that's an alternative option, right? So what they argue is, he was falsely attributing to himself prophethood for a greater good. And as a social reformer, he believed he had to make such a radical claim that he was the messenger of God to transform the immoral and decadent society he was living in. And it wouldn't make him deluded if he was basically a moral liar because he, he knew that he was not speaking the truth and it would not make him a liar because he was lying for a moral reason, right? So therefore, he would be a moral reformer and like most moral reformers, he had to choose the lesser of two evils, right? This is a very interesting counter argument. But it's a false, misplaced argument. Because it's irrational to assert that a claim to prophethood will be required to make the necessary moral changes. In actual fact, his claim to prophethood was the very thing that prevented him to making moral changes in the first place. That's the point. He could have still become a moral reformer, but basically used some other type of moral lie or white lie, right? But the very fact that he claimed that he was a prophethood initially prevented him from gaining any ground in the first place. He was mocked, ridiculed and abused. So a reform will not make such a claim, especially if that claim created far more obstacles in reaching his objective. Also, the Prophet Muhammad wasallam went through immense hardships, yet he did not sacrifice his message. If a reformer had to make the less of two evils, why would he, he allow his companions to be tortured, and abused and killed? Why would he be starving to death? Why would he be abused? Where, what happened to the lesser of two evils algorithm that he was using? He wasn't using it for this, this issue. And what's very interesting is this, that he wasn't a moral reformer per se. His main objective was about worship. He was a spiritual reformer. And this is the interesting point here. And what's interesting as well, if he was choosing a lesser of two evils and he was a moral reformer, then why didn't he ac accept conditional political power? He was offered conditional political power, but he rejected it. So this claim doesn't make any sense at all. Now, I want to quickly just browse through some of his teachings because when we consider that he wasn't a liar and he wasn't deluded, his teachings support that. His teaching support, if we analyze his teachings, I'm a true believer. If you're not a reductionist, that you don't reduce his teachings to one or two hadith, but you understand the context and you see the, the whole corpus of teachings together, it's impossible to claim he's a liar and it's impossible to claim that he was deluded. For example, consider the teachings on mercy and compassion. I'm, I'm not going to read this out to you all, but consider that the Prophet Muhammad upon whom BP said, God is compassionate and loves compassion. The Prophet Muhammad upon whom BP said, the merciful one shows mercy to those who are themselves merciful to others. So show mercy to whatever, Muslim, non-Muslim, animal, whoever it is, show mercy on earth and he who is in heaven will show mercy to you. 
What about contentment and spirit spirituality? <coughs> the Prophet Muhammad upon whom BP said, Richness is not having many possessions, rather true richness is the richness of the soul. What about love? The Prophet Muhammad upon whom he said, Love for linnas, love for humanity, what you love for yourself. This is narrated by Bukhari, found in Tariq al Kabir. He also said, and this can be found in Ibn Hibban, the servant of God does not reach the reality of faith until he loves for the people what he loves for himself. Also, very famous, I really love this tradition. By the one who has my soul in his hand, you will not enter the garden until you believe and you will not believe until you love one another. Shall I point out to you something which will make you love one another? If you do it, make the greeting of peace be wide, widespread among you. <coughs> what about community and peace? The Prophet Muhammad was asked, What sort of deeds or traits of Islam are good? The Messenger of God replied, To feed others and to greet those whom you know and those whom you do not know. By God, he does not truly believe, the Prophet said, upon him be peace. By God, he does not truly believe. He repeated this three times. And then someone asked, Who, O Messenger of God? He said, He whose neighbor is not safe from his mischief. And neighbor, neighborliness from the Islamic point of view is your whole community. 40 houses to the left, 40 houses to the right, and in the modern times, 40 houses above, 40 houses below. And it includes Muslim and non-Muslim. So you should have no mischief. That's why the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad are so against any form of extremism. What about charity and humanitarianism? Charity does not diminish wealth. Feed the sick, feed the hungry, and free the captives. What about character and good manners? The believers who show the most perfect faith are those who are the best character and the best of you are those who are best to their wives. God has revealed to me that you should adopt humility so no one oppresses each other, no one oppresses another. So many of these teachings, even about animals and, and, and the environment, removing harmful things from the road is an act of charity. Whoever kills a sparrow or anything bigger than that without a just cause, God would hold him account on the day of resurrection. A prostitute saw a dog thirsty on a hot day and his tongue was hanging from thirst. She drew some water from it from her shoe for, it, for, for the dog. Uh, she drew water in her shoe to feed the dog, to quench the dog's thirst. And Allah forgave her and gave her paradise. And who could go through his character? There's so many beautiful teachings concerning the character of the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace. One particular that comes in, into mind that relates to people like me and you on how we interact with the rest of the community is that he had hilm, forbearance. That he responded to evil with that which was better. And we gave many stories in the past few days, we gave many stories concerning this. But just to remind you what the Quran says, Allah says, Good and evil are not equal. Respond to evil with that which is better and the enmity between you and another person will change, will transform into intimate bosom friendship. So Muslims should be forbearing, tolerate harm and aggression and to respond to negativity and evil with positivity and goodness and will create a more harmonious society. And this really was a key characteristic of prophethood and of the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace. So just to end, epistemologically, okay, from the point of view of knowledge and of truth, if you reject Muhammad upon him be peace, it is epistemically equivalent of rejecting your mother gave birth to you. Honestly, because what evidence do you have that your mother gave birth to you? What evidence do you have? All you have is your mother's testimony, really. You don't have a DNA test certificate. And even if you do, you didn't do the DNA test yourself, so it's still testimonial, because it's a certificate, you have to rely on the state of others. You rely on the testimony of your father, the testimony of your mother, testimony of the birth certificate. Even if you claim you have photos or videos, that doesn't make sense, because you have to rely on the testimony that that person in the videos and photos is actually you. So all you have is testimony. 
I'm not rejecting it as a source of knowledge, of course not. If you study epistemology, it's a valid source of knowledge. But I'm saying you just have four or five testimonies. But compare that to what we just discussed. Historical narrative, testimonies, psychological profile. The weight of evidence is greater than the evidence that you have to claim that your mother gave birth to you. So epistemologically, epistemically, if you reject the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace as a prophet, it's epistemically equivalent of rejecting that your mother gave birth to you. And let me end with the story. I came from abroad once. I, I was abroad doing some lectures and when I came back I felt really dis disheartened with this type of work. And after Fajr, after the morning prayer, I made dua, a supplication. And I really prayed to Allah specifically, Oh Allah, show me a sign. This is the type of work I should be doing. You know, strengthen my heart kind of thing. And I, and I gave a very specific sign. I said, I'm going to have a debate in the evening at Queen Mary University, University with Professor Graham Thompson. After the debate, or during the debate, let someone become a Muslim. I was so specific and one and if you study our spiritual tradition when you make supplications to God you have to believe they're going to come true and you have to believe that he has the ability sometimes we're very kind of blasé with our supplications oh God if you can if you can and you know just do this generally and you know we're scared it's as if we're talking to someone who has no ability so have a relationship with, with, with Allah so I made that specific supplication the evening comes I had the debate with Professor Graham Thompson, I really believe that my du'a is going to be answered. Half Greek, half Serbian guy called George comes, Queen Mary University. He comes up to me after the debate. There's the lectern or the table. There's lots of people surrounding me. Not that many, but there's some brothers there were having a discussion. And he says, you know, I find Islam quite compelling. You know, I read some of the literature, but I want to know more about the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. I'm quite unsure. And we had a very long discussion. I think it's about an hour and a half. Standing up in the same auditorium was giving evidence, having discussions with him and I was like, I, I know, I can feel it, there's something about his face that, you know, the nur, the light is there, right? And I was discussing with him and then I was getting a bit, you know, alpha male, Greek-like, yeah? I said, look, let me just be very honest with you, right? Freedom of religion, freedom of belief, there's no forcing, but let me just say something. You are a man of integrity, you're, an, you're a man of intellectual integrity. Uh, and I said to him, how do you know your mother gave birth to you? And I gave him all the evidence for the Prophet Muhammad upon him peace, something very similar we heard today. And I said to him, since you're an amount of, of integrity, I don't mind. Don't believe, it's, it's not a problem. But at least do me a favor and be intellectually just. And I threw my Blackberry phone, I had a Blackberry phone at that time, I believe. I threw my phone at him and said, phone your mom and say, mom, I have to doubt that you gave birth to me because I'm doubting something with more evidence. So do it, at least do that for me Because I just want you to be sincere and have intellectual integrity I'm not telling you to believe But at least follow through with the implications of what you've just rejected So he became Muslim And this guy, MashaAllah He is one of the most beautiful brothers I know His akhlaq, his adab is second to none And he loves his mom like no one else and He has a very special love and a very special care for his mother. And every time I see him, I feel humbled because of who he is as a personality. So, from a philosophical point of view, if it's true that this is all the evidence for the Prophet Muhammad being the final Prophet, and this is the only evidence you have for your mother giving birth to you, then from an epistemic point of view, rejecting the Prophet Muhammad upon, upon whom be peace is equivalent, is tantamount to rejecting your mother gave birth to you. So to summarize the argument, the Prophet وسلم, had a claim, that claim was a claim of prophethood. He wasn't lying, he wasn't deluded, he must have been speaking the truth. But what's more significant, we need to become ambassadors to the message of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, to internalize his message, which is one of compassion, one of fairness, one of tolerance, and getting people to reconnect themselves back to the Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.